The Leader of the Opposition, Mr Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I start by welcoming and congratulating the member for Maidenhead on her appointment as Prime Minister. I wish her well in that position and I'm glad that her election was quick and short. <laughs> Can I also um, commend her? Uh, it's all right. I'm looking at you. Can I also commend the remarks that she made about the horrific events in Nice? Absolutely horrific! What happened? Those innocent people that lost their lives, and one hopes that this is not going to be repeated elsewhere. I was pleased that she mentioned the situation in Turkey, and I support her call for calm and restraint on all sides in Turkey. After the attempted coup, I called a number of friends in Istanbul and Ankara and asked them what was going on. The older ones there felt it was like a repeat of the 1980 coup and they were horrified that bombs were falling just near the Turkish parliament. Can we please not return to a Europe of military coups and dictatorships, which is what was still pertaining at that time? So I endorse the Prime Minister's comments in that respect. And I would like to pay tribute to the Foreign Office staff who helped British citizens both in France and, of course, in Turkey were caught up with the recent events. The motion today, Mr Speaker, is one of enormous importance to this country and, indeed, to the wider world. There's nothing particularly new in this motion. The principle on nuclear weapons was debated in 2007. But I think this is an opportunity to scrutinise what the government is doing. The funds involved in Trident renewal are massive. And we must, I think, also consider the complex, both moral and strategic issues of our country possessing weapons of mass destruction. There's also the question of its utility. Do these weapons of mass destruction, for that is what they are, act deterrent to the threats we face, and is that deterrent credible? The motion, Mr Speaker, says nothing of the costs involved which are ballooning ever upwards. In 2006, the Ministry of Defence estimated that construction costs would be £20 billion. But by last year, that had become 50% higher at £31 billion, with another £10 billion added as a contingency fund. The very respected member for Reigate has estimated the cost at £167 billion, though it is understood that delays may have added to those credible figures since that estimates were made. I've seen some estimates as high as over £200 billion for the replacement and the, for the, I'm coming to you, the replacement and of course the running costs. Yes, of course, give way. Giving way on the subject of costs, isn't it true the key cost here? is the one we remember every Remembrance Sunday, which is the millions of lives we lost in two world yeah, wars. Yeah. And would he care to estimate the millions of lives that would have been lost in a third conventional war, which was avoided before 1989 because of the nuclear deterrent? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We all remember those that lost their lives on Remembrance Sunday and all the other times. That is the price of war. My question is, does our possession of nuclear weapons make us more secure or, and make the world more secure, yes or no? Yes, of course, of course there is a debate about that. That is what a democratic parliament does, has a debate about these issues. And I'm putting forward a point of view that the honourable member may not agree with, but I'm sure he's going to listen to it with great respect, as he always does. So can the... Yes. The Labour leader has shown to us in the past that his domestic solution to domestic security threats has been to parley with a provisional IRA. What is his opportunity? What, what opportunity? What uh, is his tactic now in how he will deal with a real threat to all of the people of this nation? Prime Minister, towards the end of her speech, got to the point about the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and multilateral disarmament. I was interested in that. Surely we should start from that basis that we want and are determined to bring about a nuclear free world. There are six party talks going on with North Korea. China is a major economic provider for North Korea. I would have thought the relationship with China and North Korea is perhaps the key to a way forward in that respect. I'll give away one more time for over there. 
how would the right honourable gentleman persuade my thousands of Korean constituents that it is a good idea to disarm unilaterally while their families and friends living in our ally, South Korea, face a constant nuclear deterrent from a belligerent regime over their northern border? Well, I too have, uh, I too have Korean constituents, as do many of us, and we welcome their work and their participation in our society. The point I was making was that the six-party talks are a very important way forward of bringing about a peace treaty on the Korean Peninsula. That surely is in the interests of everybody to achieve. Not easy, I fully understand that, but nevertheless something we should be trying to do. Um, so I'd be grateful if the Prime Minister or the Secretary of State for Defence, when he replies, would let us know the government's estimate of the total lifetime cost of what we're being asked to endorse today. No, it's hardly surprising that in May 2009 there was, Mr Speaker, a very intense debate going on in the then Shadow Cabinet about going for a less expensive upgrade by converting to air-launched missiles. And the Right Honourable Member for Mid-Sussex said at the time, the arguments have not yet been had in public in nearly an adequate enough way to warrant the spending of this nation's treasure on, that scale, on the scale that will be required. Seven years later, perhaps we're in the same situation. This motion proposes an open-ended commitment to maintain Britain's current nuclear capability for as long as the global security situation demands. We on these benches, despite our differences on some issues, have always argued for the aim of a nuclear-free world. We might differ on how it's going to be achieved, but we're united in our commitment to that end. In 2007, my right honourable friend, the member for Derby South, embarked on a meaningful attempt to build consensus for, the multi for multilateral disarmament. And will the government address where these successor submarines are going to be based. The people of Scotland have rejected Trident being based in Faz Lane Naval Base on the Clyde. The SNP government is opposed to it, as is Scottish Labour. We're not debating a nuclear deterrent, but our continued possession of weapons of mass destruction. We're discussing eight missiles, 40 warheads, with each warhead believed to be eight times as powerful as the atomic bomb which killed 140,000 people in Hiroshima in 1945. We're talking about, Mr Speaker, 40 warheads, each one with a capacity to kill more than one million people. What is the threat that we are facing that over a million people's deaths actually deters? It's not from the, it's not from the so-called Islamic State. Their poisonous death cult glories in killing as many people as possible, as we've seen brutally in Syria to East Africa, from France to Turkey. It hasn't deterred our ally, Saudi Arabia, from committing dreadful acts in, in the Yemen. It didn't stop Saddam Hussein's atrocities in the 1980s or the invasion of Kuwait in 1990. It didn't deter the war crimes in the Balkans in the 1990s, nor the genocide in Rwanda. Mr. Speaker, I make it clear today, coming to you, I make it clear today that I would not take a decision that kills millions of innocent, innocent people. I do not believe the threat of mass murder is a legitimate way to go about dealing with international relations. Grateful to my right honourable friend for giving way. As leader of the opposition, he will be privy to briefings from the National Security Council. Can he explain to the House when the last time he sought and received such a briefing is, and what is his assessment of the new Russian military nuclear protocols which permit first strike using nuclear um, weapons and that they can be used to de-escalate conventional military conflicts. What's his assessment of that? Britain also at the current time re retains the right to first strike as well and so I would have thought the best way forward is to develop the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty into a no first strike situation as a good way forward. So I respect my, my honourable friend's wish to live in a nuclear free world. I know he believes that very strongly. So I think, Mr Speaker, we should take our commitments under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty very seriously. It was in 1968 
It was in 1968, Mr Speaker, when the led, then Labour government, led by Harold Wilson, inaugurated and indeed signed the Non-Proliferation Treaty. In 2007, our then Foreign Secretary, my friend the member for Derby South, rightly said, we must strengthen the NPT in all its aspects. The judgment we made 40 years ago that the eventual abolition of nuclear weapons was in all of our interests. The then Labour government committed to reduce our stocks of operationally available warheads by a further 20%. I congratulate our government on doing that. I indeed attended NPT review conference when those congratulations were spoken. But can the government say what the Labour Foreign Secretary said in 2007, my commitment, my commitment to the vision of a world free of nuclear weapons is undimmed? Is this government's vision of a nuclear free world undimmed? She also spoke of the international community's clear commitment to a Middle East nuclear weapons free zone. Instead, Mr Speaker, despite un unanimous support at the no, I won't give way, at the last two nuclear non proliferation treaty five yearly review conferences calling for a uh, weapons of mass destruction free zone across the Middle East. That surely is something that we can all sign up to and all support and I look forward to the Defence Secretary's support for that position when he replies to the debate this evening. Yes, I, way, yeah. I, I thank my right friend for giving way. He's speaking uh, about previous party policy. At the Chair of Cabinet last Tuesday, there was an agreement that current party policy would be conveyed by the front bench. When will we hear it? <laughs> I, I thank my friend for his view. As he well knows, the um, party decided that it wanted to support the um, retention of um, nuclear weapons. We also decided that we would have a policy review, which is being undertaken by my friend, the member for Norwich South at the present time. He is as well aware as I am of what the existing policy is. He's also as well aware as I am of the views that I put forward in the leadership election last year, quite clearly on my views on nuclear weapons. Hence, the fact that we're having a free vote so far as Labour members of Parliament are concerned here this evening. And Mr Speaker, other countries have made serious efforts, serious efforts to, I'll come to you in a moment, has made serious efforts to bring about nuclear disarmament within the terms of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. South Africa abandoned all of its nuclear programs after the end of apartheid and thus brought about a nuclear weapons free zone across the whole continent. After negotiation, Libya ended all research into nuclear weapons. The Ukraine at the end of the Cold War gave up its nuclear weapons, albeit, albeit those weapons were under the control of the former Soviet Union and latterly of Russia. Likewise, Kazakhstan did the same, which helped to bring about a Central Asia nuclear weapons free zone. And in Latin America, Argentina, Argentina and Brazil both gave up their nuclear programs. And I do commend the government and other governments around the world that negotiated seriously with great patience and at great length with Iran, which helped to encourage Iran to give up its nuclear program. And I think we should pay tribute to President Obama for his achievements in doing that. The former Conservative Defence Secretary, Michael Portillo, said, and he was a Defence Secretary, Yes, I come to you. When I finish this quote, to say we need nuclear weapons in this situation would imply that Germany and Italy are trembling in their boots because they don't have a nuclear deterrent, which I think is clearly not the case. Is it not time, Mr. Speaker, for us to step up to the plate and promote rapidly nuclear disarmament? Yes, a good point. Well, for my Rhonda friend, give way. He, like me, stood in May 2015 on a party policy agreed at our late hour conference through our mechanisms within the party for the renewal of uh, continuous at sea deterrent. Now, he has a uh, shadow uh, front bench and a shadow cabinet now in his own image, which agreed uh, last week, I understand, to put that policy from the front bench. Is he going to do it or is it going to be doing the wind up? Yeah. 
I, well, I thank my friend for the intervention. He is well aware of what the uh, policy was. He's also well aware there's a policy review being undertaken. He's also very well aware of the case that I'm, the case that I'm making for nuclear disarmament. And so. Well, to him for giving way. He will be aware that there is currently a multilateral process going on at the UN where over 130 countries are negotiating in good faith for a treaty to ban nuclear weapons. Whoa. Does he agree with me that this government's refusal even to attend, let alone take part in that, Whoa. seriously raises questions about their commitment to a world without nuclear weapons? Oh. I think it is a great shame that the government doesn't attend those, um, those negotiations, and I wish they would, because I do thank the government for attending the humanitarian effects of war conference in 2014. I do thank them for their participation in the non-proliferation treaty, but I think they should go and support the idea of a worldwide ban on nuclear weapons. Nobody in this House actually wants nuclear weapons. The debate, the debate is about how one gets rid of them and the, the way one does it. There are questions too, Mr Speaker, about the operational utility of nuclear armed submarines. I would ask the Minister again, perhaps the Secretary of State for Defence can answer in his reply, what assessment the Government has made of the impact of underwater drones, surveillance of wave patterns and other advanced detection techniques, which could indeed make the submarine technology... Order, 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 Mr Shelbrook, I want you to aspire to the apogee of statesmanship. But shrieking from a sedentary position, despite your magnificent suit, is not the way to achieve it. Calm yourself, man. I am trying to help you, even if you don't know it. Mr Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And so, can the Prime Minister confirm whether the UK will back the proposed nuclear weapons ban treaty, which I understand will be put before the UN General Assembly in September, probably before we return to the House after the summer recess. I think that's an important point. Yes, OK. Sorry, let me start. I thank uh, the right honourable member for giving way. We can agree on this, that nuclear weapons are truly the most repugnant weapons that have ever been invented by man. But the key is invented. We cannot disinvent them, but we can control them, and this is what this is all about, controlling nuclear weapons. If this is all, if, if this is all about controlling them, then perhaps we should think for a moment of the obligations we have signed up to as a nation by signing the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, Article 6 of which says the declared nuclear weapon states, of which we are one, must take steps towards disarmament, and others must not acquire nuclear weapons. It hasn't been an easy passage, but it ha the NPT has helped, to reduce, has helped to reduce the level of nuclear weapons around the world. Yes, I do give way. Very good, honourable gentlemen, for giving way. I'm absolutely stunned to hear the argument made to the opposite side with the Tory benches there that you cannot disinvent. That is the argument you could employ for chemical weapons and biological weapons. That is the argument they are using for nuclear weapons today. Well, the member is absolutely right because we have achieved uh, the Chemical Weapons Convention. We have achieved a ban on cluster weapons. We have achieved some other things around the world by serious long-term negotiation. There is obviously the question. Yes, of course. Yes, sorry. I thank my honourable friend for giving way. My honourable friend is very fond of telling us all that party conference is sovereign when it comes to party policy. Last year, party conference voted overwhelmingly in favour of maintenance of the nuclear deterrent. So why aren't we hearing a defence of the government's motion from the dispatch box now? Party policy is also to review our policies. That is why we have reviews. And uh, what I would also say is that we have to look at the issues of employment, 
the issues of investment and the necessity, I think, of having government intervention through a defence diversification agency, to, as we had under the previous Labour government, to support industries that have become over-reliant on defence contracts and therefore wish to move into other contracts and other work as well. The Prime Minister mentioned the Unite policy conference last week, which I, um, I also attended that conference. And Unite, the union, as do other unions, have members working in all sectors of high-tech manufacturing, which of course includes the defence sector, which of course includes the development of both the submarines and the warheads and the nuclear reactors that go into the submarines. Their policy conference, Unite's that is, endorsed its previous position, which is opposed to Trident but wants a government in place with a proper diversification agency. The union has been thinking these things through and thinking these things through on a way of maintaining jobs within that sector, the very high skills that jobs that are there. Our defence review is being undertaken by my friend, the member for Norwich South, and I also pay tribute to the excellent work done by my friend, the member for Islington South and Finsbury, in undertaking that review. Mr Speaker, whatever people's views... All right. uh, order that. Order. I think the right honourable gentleman has signalled an intention to take an intervention. Just before we do, I, order. I just make the point that there's a lot of noise, but at the last reckoning. Order. I don't require. Order. I'll, order. 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 I'll tell the honourable gentleman what the position is, and he'll take it whether he likes it or not. <laughs> Fifty-three members wish to speak in this debate, and I want to accommodate members, and I ask members to take account of that to help each other. That's all. Caroline Flint. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Could I ask my right honourable friend? In the last Labour government, because of our stand on supporting non-proliferation, as a nuclear deterrent country, we were able to influence the reduction of many, many, many nuclear warheads around the world. Does he really think that by abandoning our position as one of those countries that hold nuclear weapons, we would have had much, as much influence without them as with? Yeah, 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 yeah. We did indeed help to reduce the number of nuclear warheads, and indeed... I attended a number of conferences where British government representatives were there that made the point the number of UK warheads had reduced and they had encouraged others to do the same. And I talked about the nuclear weapons free zones that have been achieved around the world. That's a good thing. However, we're now into a step change where we're actually saying we're prepared to spend a very, very large sum of money on the development of a new generation of nuclear weapons. And I draw her attention, I'm sure she's aware of it, to Article 6 of the NPT, which requires us to take steps towards disarmament. That's what it actually says. And so, uh, Mr Speaker, in case it's not obvious to the House at the moment, I'm not going to give away any more because I'm running up against the clock. I will actually be... I will actually be voting against this motion tonight, Mr Speaker, which I'm sure will be of an enormous surprise to the whole House. Um, I do it because of my own views. I do it because of the way... Uh, order. Uh, po po I apologise for having to interrupt the right honourable gentleman. There's a point of order. Point of order, Mr Jamie Reid. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, seeking your guidance, sir, on the uh, accuracy of the... Uh, language used by the Leader of the Opposition there, we are not voting tonight on new nuclear warheads, simply the submarines used with which to deploy those uh, uh, missiles. This is something fundamentally different to new missiles. Well, the answer to the Honourable Gentleman is that it is up to each Honourable and Right Honourable Member to read the motion, to interpret it as he or she thinks fit, and to make a judgment accordingly. Not a matter for the Chair. Mr Jeremy Corbyn. The, the issue, of course, is the submarines, but also the new weapons that will have to go into those submarines as and when they've been built, if they're built. I just think we should pause for a moment, Mr Speaker, and think of the indiscriminate nature of what nuclear weapons do and the ca catastrophic effects of their use anywhere. As I said, I've attended... NPT conferences and preparatory conferences over many years with representatives of all parties in this House at various times. And I was very pleased when the last government, the coalition government, finally, if slightly reluctantly, accepted the invitation to take part in the Humanitarian Effects of War conference in Vienna in 2014. Anyone who attended that, who heard from British nuclear test veterans Pacific Islanders or civilians in Russia or the United States 
who have suffered the effects of nuclear explosions cannot be totally dispassionate about the effects of the use of nuclear weapons. It is an indiscriminate weapon of mass destruction. Many colleagues across the House will vote for weapons tonight because they believe they do serve a useful military purpose. But for those who believe in multilateral disarmament, I ask, is this not an, an unwise motion by the government, which gives no answers on costs and no answers on disarmament? For those of us who believe in, in aiming for a nuclear-free world, for those people who are deeply concerned about the spiralling costs, this motion has huge questions to answer, answer which I believe has been failed to address in this debate. If we want a nuclear weapons free world, this is an opportunity when we can start down that road and try and bring others with us, as has been achieved to some extent over the past, uh, past few decades. Surely, Mr Speaker, it's an effort we should try and make rather than go down the road the government is suggesting for us this evening. Yeah.